we go. Okay, we will move on to the next slide. So our agenda today is we're gonna look at the year at a glance that is in the memo of understanding. We're gonna look at some updates and we're gonna also look at some requirements set forth in statute for CSI or tier three schools. We're gonna do a little continuation of last meeting, which was in December about the leadership, the leadership, I speak to this morning, leadership team agenda structure and content, specifically looking at resource equity audit and some of the progress monitoring. And then hopefully we'll have some time for some questions and thoughts so that you can get any, if you have questions or any clarifications that you need. I just wanna look at my notes real quickly. I didn't, I have a lot on here and I don't wanna forget anything. So also before we move on, I just wanted to say we have had some principals reach out to me and other coaches indicating that they can't make certain meetings or for whatever variety of reasons. We do encourage, you know, principals are expected to attend these meetings, but we recognize that you have a lot of things on your plate. You are juggling a lot of different spinning and spinning a lot of plates in the air and you're juggling a lot of, of, a lot of different objects in the air. So we do ask that if you are not able to attend as a principal, Take one, ask one of your, if possible, ask one of your uh, leadership team members if they are able to attend these meetings because this is about shared leadership as well and it doesn't all fall on the on the shoulders of the principal. Yes, the principal does lead the work, but they don't, they don't do the work in isolation or by themselves. So think about that. We understand that things happen. But think about seeing if another member of your leadership team can attend these meetings. And we also, because these are recorded, we also encourage you to, once the recording is made available and the slide deck is made available, integrate this in as a part of your agenda um, and your leadership team meeting so that you don't miss out on any of that information. So we do recommend that as well. And I think that is all with my notes. Okay, moving on. The year at a glance, just like we did in November and December, we're still looking at progress monitoring. We're, we're, we're looking at our data. Um, we're hoping that these meetings are can be used as tools or resources for schools to be able to move forward in their school improvement uh, process. And this is on page two of your MOU, if you want to go back to it. Um, and again, it's going to depend on where you are in your implementation of your plan. You may be spending a lot of time in your data. You may be spending a lot on tools or resources, it really depends on where your school is in that process. Okay. Updates. I realized that when we put out the survey back in August, I know Renee did this and asked principals what would be the best, best time and day to have these monthly meetings? And the survey came back and said Thursdays at 10. We, uh, we, we, um, we accommodated that, but in the process, we realized that we've scheduled them during some vacation times. So the February 22nd meeting will be rescheduled to February 29th due to the February break. That extra 29th is actually helping us out here. That extra leap year day is actually helping us out because we wouldn't have that in a normal a normal year. So it will be on the 29th. Um, and I will send out a Zoom invite and agenda when we get closer to that meeting date. And that will be sent through grants for me. And just a process question or process point. Um, grants for me, you will get an email, but we also have the feature now where it gets um, stored in your history log. So if for some reason you're like, hey, I didn't get this or it got lost in my long list of emails that I get on a daily basis, just go check your history log because it might be in there. And then usually that has all the information in there as well. So you don't have to go dig through your emails. You can always just go check the history log to see if it was put out yet. Uh, another update is the ESSA dashboard validation webinar. Now for some of you, this may not mean anything to you, uh, but for some of the smaller schools, you may be wearing a lot of different hats. So this may mean something to you, but um, there's a webinar next week to talk about the valid validation of that data. Um, and a uh, priority notice went out to superintendents on Tuesday, uh, January 22nd, 
with information about how to validate the ESSA dashboard. So um, you might want to talk to your superintendent and if you want more information about that. And then understanding scores from the May through year assessment. I think some of you did attend the one that was held a couple weeks ago um, with Krista Averill. Very thorough, very informative. Um, I attended it along with some other coaches. Really highly recommend that you or someone from your leadership team attend the February 8th. Um, Krista does a really good job of kind of doing an overview, like what's the difference between RIT scores and the main through year, but then she also gets, gives time and gets down into the weeds so that you actually know how to access some of your data. Um, and she has some really good takeaways and some really good recommendations. So again, highly recommend you or somebody from your leadership team attend that. And you can, I, I'll show you how to get to that. Um, I can also put it in the notes as well. Uh, but you can go to the professional learning calendar, which should have this on there. She'll have both of these uh, webinars listed on the professional learning calendar, which you can access on the main department of education. If you just go up to the top, at top it'll say professional learning, and you can click on that. And it has all the professional learning available at the department. And then the last one is, I know I constantly get this question, and I was anticipating it, the running of Maine's model of school support and identifications. So in that priority notice that went out to superintendents on Tuesday, this past Tuesday, um, there were some updates about the ESSA dashboard, but then there was also information about identifications. So I'll just read it verbatim so that you guys can hear it. So this was actually what was in the priority notice. Information related to Maine's model of school support um, remains unavailable until the Maine Department of Education receives final U.S. DOE amendment approval and once finalized and provided, Maine DOE staff will reach out to schools identified for additional support. So that being said, we do have a tentative date and I bolded it and I highlight and I underlined it and I italicized it because I want to really stress this is tentative. So if this date changes, um, it's, you know, it's a part, a lot of it is due to um, the US DOE and then just working out that. So um, the hope or the tentative plan is that identifications or notifications of identifications uh, for this year will be February 26th to March 1st. I know that's really pushed back, but as you can tell from the first paragraph there that a lot of this was just because of uh, trying to get information back um, from the U.S. Department of Education. I'm sure that's not a lot of the, um, I'm sure that's not the information that some of you wanted to hear. And the next part of that is, does that mean that if I'm a school that was I'm unable to exit, you were only given a partial allocation? Yes, your, your additional allocation will have to be put on hold until that notification or identification or the main model of school support gets run again. Um, so uh, it's kind of the status quo at this point. Um, if you were re-identified, you're not gonna get notified because you're gonna be on for uh, three, three years. But if you were a school that was unable to exit, then you will stay that status until we're able, hopefully the tentative date of end of February, March to do the, the um, when the Maine's model school sport is run again, um, that new identification. And if that's confusing, you can reach out to me um, by email or separately um, later after this meeting if you want more clarification, but probably won't be able to provide much more because we are still waiting for all that data to get calibrated and calculated and all that. So the next one is weird. I, I get a lot of questions through uh, school principals, through coaches about like, the DOE is making us do this. The main department of education is making us do all this stuff on our application. They're making us do all this work. And for some of you, you may already know this, but for some of you, some of the newer principals, um, you may not realize that the application, the SIG application is actually based on statute. And so what I did was I just threw the statute up here. It's, it's way longer than this. If you've ever seen the SS statute, it's like 200 pages long. So I just took different excerpts that ex excerpts that actually apply to school improvement. Um, but in ESSA section 111, little b, one, big b, 
I through um, VI, it talks about what needs to be in that plan, um, specific stakeholders. Um, and that's why in section one, we ask that you tell us who is a part of your leadership team. And then on top of that, you also need to talk about who was part of that planning of the, of the school improvement plan. So that little section on the right-hand side with the little boxes, um, you need to tell who was part of that plan to also meet the statutory requirements. Um, we get a lot of questions about evidence-based interventions. As you can see that that is also part of the statute, that the plan needs to include evidence-based interventions to address any of the issues that you have. Um, there needs to be a school level needs assessment and that's where the comprehensive needs assessment comes into play. We are also trying to, because every school that is a tier three school also has to be title one school wide, we're trying to combine that so it's one plan. So you should be using it for your title one school wide operation, but also for the SIG application as well. We are getting a lot of questions and a lot of concerns about the identify resource and equities, which is also a section on the application. Uh, but as you can see, it is also a requirement set forth in statute and that you have to identify that resource and equity. Um, and then through the implementation of your plan, it addresses those inequities. And so that's why like, some people when they're like, why is Monique keep pushing this back to me? Why does she, you know, that's why, because it clearly states in the statute that if you identify a resource and equity in your plan, then somewhere your strategic plan should be addressing that. So it's all these connections back. And then um, there is multi-levels of support that are required, and that's why you need all the different levels. But one thing I wanted to talk about was that really they say school in the statute. So really this shouldn't just be something that's isolated with the principal or with just the leadership team. It really should be also disseminated and communicated out to the school as well as a whole and also the community. And then um, the monitoring by the SCA. So I put an asterisk here there is because um, in, the past, in the past, this hasn't been as monitored as much as it should have been. And in full transparency, we did get a finding from the US Department of Education that we weren't doing good enough job monitoring our SIG funds. So be prepared that there is gonna be a little more of that coming um, in the very near future about how you're spending your funds, um, and almost like you do with you know, any of you who are familiar with the um, ESCA monitoring, we're going to try and embed that into that monitoring as well so that um, it's a little bit more connected because some of the things that you're going to have to submit or show for um, ESCA monitoring will be the same for the SIG monitoring because it is Title I money. So just think about that as well. And the other piece I wanted to talk about here was that when you reopen your application or change the status to revisions completed. Part of the, when I review it again, part of that is the monitoring, right? So like making sure that your updates and your changes and your revisions still align with all these pieces uh, that's written in statute, but that it that just all aligns to the plan as well. So again, I hope this explains why it feels like you know, we're just making you guys do all this stuff, but it's written in statute. And then again, there's another piece of the statute, which is section 1003E, little e. And again, this was way longer than that, but um, just wanted to point out some things as well, especially if you're hiring an outside um, external consultant, um, it is written in statute that you do have to have a process. Now I have gotten some questions about what does that look like? Is there a form? There really isn't a form because it is local control. So, it's really gonna be based on what your local procurement policies are for circuits and services. You have a collective bargaining agreement, um, your hiring processes and all that. So I'm not gonna ask for it or it's not gonna be required that you submit it in the application, but you will wanna keep track of all that in case you get monitored or you get a FOA request or something like that, um, that you keep track of it. And then the last piece I wanted to talk about was there is a section I in 1003, little i, that states that the state has to provide a list of all the tier three schools and what strategies um, that they are implementing with these funds 
Now we currently don't have that, but we are, I'm working on it. So stay tuned because I might be asking um, for your more information from you just to verify before this gets posted publicly. I don't know what that public uh, posting is gonna look like, uh, but I just wanna give you a heads up so that if you do get requested for some information or um, you have community members or something like that, you know that it is, it is um, in the works right now. Just reviewing my notes, sorry guys, okay. So as a continuation of last week's or last month's um, meeting in December, we really want the LT meeting structure, structure and agenda be used as a tool. Um, and we talked about that at the last meeting and we wanna just continue with that. And we have been getting some questions from, you know, from schools saying, why is the main department of education and making us do this? Well, we're not telling you, you have to use this template. And I'm sorry if that was miscommunicated last month. This template was created based on evidence-based practice, which shows that um, to have an effective continuous improvement process, you need to have an effective leadership team. And an effective leadership team, this, if you're, if you're having the, the research shows or the evidence shows to be effective, these are the components that you would include in your LT meeting agenda every time you meet. So we just base this on what the evidence said. And the evidence I have the this site right there, and I'll make sure I include those, um, those URLs for you uh, so you can check them. This is the same as what we presented in December, so it's not anything new, but just, I wanted to get some, I just wanna clarify that on. I've had several coaches reach out to me and say, the principals are like, why are you making us do this? And it's not that, and this is a template. So if your leadership team agendas are already addressing these areas, you don't have to use the template, which is kind of a, again, if you go back to the, uh, to the year at a glance, we're just trying to help with tools and resources for schools to help them through this continuous improvement process and also to implement their school improvement uh, plan. I did want to make a note that many of you, I think all of you, have also 20 FY23 uh, strategic plan or SIG uh, application. This should be embedded in this work is two, in two, right? So you are running two different applications at the same time. Hopefully your strategic plans are not in complete opposition and they're just, um, they complement each other or their continuation of it, but make sure that you are also reviewing your plans and your strategic, um, and your action steps and uh, anything that you're doing in your FY20 plan, you need to be reviewing that as well when you're doing your FY24. So I just wanted to make sure that, put a note on that as well. And then again, going back to using the agenda as a tool and looking at the year at a glance, which talks about progress monitoring, there are some components of the agenda that really focus on that progress monitoring, specifically the ongoing CNA update, the data analysis part of it, and the ongoing strategic plan. Now, I did highlight the ongoing, the resource equity audit we realized um, at the department and with um, you know, some feedback from coaches that we as the department need to do a little bit better job in providing some guidance and modeling for the resource inequity, which is something we're gonna work on right now. It won't be probably available until next year for the application, but we know that it is an area of need and we're going to work on that and try to create some guidance for schools for next year. But just like all of you guys, the state is short staffed as well. So we are working at capacity. So some of our timelines are not as, um, as quick as we would like them to be, but we're working on it. So to get back again, uh, part of that progress monitoring would be looking at your CNA update. And you know, depending on what areas you're looking at, um, you're gonna be updating information periodically if you're looking at your tenants data on a quarterly or even a weekly basis, that might be updated every time you meet. Um, if somebody, if you're using benchmarks that are only given periodically, you may not be updating your literacy and math information. Again, this is all based on where you are in your plan, but it should be a part of your CNA update. 
I also want to point out the item facilitator. You know, I, as you guys, many of you know, I was, I am a former principal and I know a lot of things get placed on principals. And again, principals are expected to lead this work, but they're not expected to do all the work. So you really want to look at your leadership team and see if there's anyone on your team that maybe could take over some of these pieces and facilitate them. So it doesn't, the work doesn't all fall on the principal. The actual work doesn't fall on the principal and you know your team's best and you know what their strengths are and what areas they might be interested in. So that's just something I really want to stress as well, um, that it shouldn't just be the principal locking themselves in their office on a Saturday trying to get all this done. That is not the intent. It's all about shared leadership um, and transparency. Um, so I want to put that little focus on that as well. So is your LT continually reviewing and updating the school CNA? Continue with that is your data analysis. Now, again, the questions that we put here were just some questions that we formulated based on that research, the evidence based on the wise ways. But your questions may be different depending on the data that you're looking at. So just some questions are, you know, is, um, is there any new data? Is there data that maybe we didn't think about? Um, and then are you progressing your goals and outcomes um, as you go along? And again, that's going to be dependent on what data is available to you. And is the data connected to your strategic plan and the action steps? And just again, the note about FY23, you should be doing this with your FY23 plan as well. Um, the FY23, um, it does expire, the funds do expire 930, but I try to explain this to schools too, that the intent of the funds is to be used in the year in which it's awarded. And then with the tidings waiver, a lot of times schools get additional time to uh, obligate and spend down those funds. But think of it as like you're almost running two plans at the same time, but they shouldn't be in opposition. They just be, should complement each other. And I do see a question. And there's a question there. If you can just hold on that, I'll try to come back to that. Um, I don't have that many slides left to present. And then the strategic plan, again, where are your action steps? Um, are you meeting those action steps? Uh, where are you in that? Go back to your SMART goal, go back to your action steps. Are we working toward that? It's end of January. Where are we in that process? Um, maybe do we need to relook at our action steps? Do we need to look at our, our, our SMART goals? Um, have we met it and we need to move, make it a little bit push ourselves or are we just not there and we need to reassess? So again, it's time to look at that as well. Um, and you may not be looking at all of them. Maybe you're just focusing on one action step, depending on where you are in that um, in the process. And are there any action steps you haven't even started yet? And is there a reason for why? And then the last one here that is that resource equity audit review. Um, there's been a lot of questions about that, and even on our own, you know, in our among our school leadership uh, team. Sorry. Our, school leadership coaches, there are some questions about that, you know, what's written in the statute versus what is actually real. Um, as I said, as a former principal, I'm thinking, what are resource inequities that I or my school has kind of control of or can actually address through our plan versus inequities that are way outside of my locus of control. And so I think we're still trying to work on that and we're gonna to try to create some guidance on that. But all that being said, do you wanna make sure that um, your SMART goals and action steps should be aligned to kind of address those identified resource inequities. So thinking back to your plan, if there's something in there that you are, you can actually tie back, like one of your action steps is tied back to one of those identified inequities, uh, that is really important. And again, I just put this slide in there again, just to give you some ideas of the things that you look at when you're looking at inequities. Um, to all the different pieces. This chart was also based, or this graphic was based on the research, and I will try to put that in when we provide the information, those links as well. They're, it's, not, it's not new links, um, we're just keep reusing them. So you might already have the links for this as well. And then these are just some kind of some takeaways that I have put together or some questions uh, based on reviewing quite a few uh, school improvement plans, looking at SMART goals, looking at action steps. 
And these are just some questions that you, um, I recommend that you think about and even think about with your leadership team, or maybe you create your own questions, maybe with your help with your leadership coach, try to think about um, those probing questions. Are we really, um, is our strategic plan really addressing our needs? Uh, but when reviewing the strategic plan, is it a SMART goal or is it an action step? I mean, I've read many SMART goals that say 75% of my of my math teachers will participate in some sort of math PD. Um, is that a SMART goal or is that more of an action step? Um, planning funds or funding plans. So are you looking at this money as like, um, and oh, we, we can go to this, you know, we're, how do we spend this money versus, hey, we have our CNA, we have our school needs assessment, we have a plan, um, we know what the district's doing, we know generally what we're doing, and how can these funds help implement the plan? And the SIG plan is more, you know, almost like really drilling down to that specific areas or specific areas that we need that help with. So are, it's really sometimes hard, and I know we do it a lot in the ESCA, like, are you planning your funds? Or are you really funding your plan or plans? So think of that as well. And I see a lot of one day um, professional learning opportunities. So again, participation, of, I'm sorry, I mean, that's my fourth one. So one day isolated workshops or an ongoing series aligned to action steps and goals. And I do have a note, because if you go up at the top there of the slide, um, we did get kind of a finding on this uh, from the US Department of Education um, when we were audited back in May. And it, you know, it says that section, they noticed that we were approving a lot of one day uh, workshops, a lot of one day conferences. So they made sure that we were aware of the section 8101 of ESSA funds. And these are ESSA funds requires that any professional development paid for with ESCA funds be evidence-based as well as sustained not standalone, one day or short term workshops, intensive, collaborative, job embedded, data driven and classroom focused. So I know that some schools um, get a little frustrated when I push back and they say, can you provide more detail? Can you give me a justification for how this meets this requirement, how it aligns to your strategic plan, how it aligns to your action step? And then I also throw in the uniform grant guidance, which says, that all costs need to be reasonable and necessary. And this is the best use of funds to meet the plan. So again, that's part of all that pushback as well. Um, going back to number three, um, again, I see a lot of participation um, goals or action steps. So thinking about is the importance of participating in a professional learning or is it more implementing the professional learning? So you go to a conference, you go to a training, and is the, is the goal more about implementing what you learned in a strategy, or is it just attending the conference or attending the professional learning? Now, this may be embedded and may be assumed, but um, it's, not, it, it's not always assumed. And this could just be a thinking question for you. If this is already happening, great. It, again, it's just kind of like come back and rethink and um, a review and that progress monitoring piece of your strategic plan. And find, I think I already mentioned this, but is this being used more as a general funding source or is it really does it dead can't speak again, designated resource to address identified needs in the strategic plan? Um, and then lastly, um, are you checking a box for compliance or are you really engaging in that continuous school improvement? And I say that because I know many of you are waiting to get the identification so that you can um, exit which is a major goal that everyone wants. We don't wanna be school improvement um, identified as tier three or CSI, but I also don't want anyone to get back on it when the models run again, um, cause it does get run every year because you just checked a box and you weren't really doing all of the evidence-based research that shows what effective school improvement is. So these are just some questions to think about. And I'm, oh, I just have one little kind of check in and it is i'll just click in poll i'm going to put that together wherever it is so i'm going to launch the poll and then i uh, just have a couple more things after that and we'll have time for questions 
because when my this is just to, for me to get a kind of like a formative assessment to see where we are and where we need to provide more training and support to schools. Okay, I'm going to give about 30 more seconds. Oh, oh yeah, we got a few more people. While you guys are finishing up, I do want to say that we are encouraging or recommending that our school coaches, um, they are attending this meeting um, because we wanted them to know what information we are presenting to the principals. Um, but we also are encouraging them, like if you couldn't attend, that they provide you or let you know when that information is available. Um, we really, uh, we want them to just kind of be partnering with you, but not representing you in these meetings or representing the schools in these meetings. Because these meetings really are to help support schools um, and be a resource and a tool for schools. So I'm gonna go ahead and just end the poll. I know I know we probably have some questions. It looks like we have pretty much consensus on that. And the last question was, what is a root cause? I knew that might be a little confusing for some. And I think part of that is going back to is it a root cause that is within the control of the school um, versus something that's outside of the school's uh, locus of control? And we will try to address that in the guidance that we provide to schools, hopefully um, beginning of next year. So thank you for that. Thank you for filling this out. It gives us a little bit idea of where schools are. And the last is just, some of the personal learning opportunities. I know some of you are participating in the multi-tiered systems of support. Um, I am trying to collaborate with Andrea um, to try to provide some more uh, continuity between what school improvement schools are doing and what's provided at the state. The concept with Kathy Bertini, uh, the Transformational Leaders Network. I know some of the principals are involved in that as well. And then a lot of schools are involved in the BAR um, training as well or the initiative um, what I was talking about here, that main DOE events calendar, I'm not sure if it'll work, but we'll see. Um, it may not get pulled up, but yeah, you guys can see that, probably not. But if you click on that, I'm not sure if you can see what I'm seeing, but if you can click on that, you'll see all of the professional development learning opportunities available at the department, and you can just click and register, and those two, the ESSA webinar and the May three-year assessment webinar on there. You can also sign up for um, office hours. Um, we do not have this one posted because it's pretty particular just for tier three. It's not open to everyone. So that's why we don't have it on the professional learning calendar. And then any of the main DOE initiatives um, that some of you may be interested in are already participating and if you click on that as well. And then resources. These are all the same, the clearinghouse, evidence-based. Um, I know that there are questions about invoicing. I don't do a lot of invoicing, but our resource is Tyra. She does all of the uh, invoicing and processing of those assessments, Krista, and any higher education questions you could 
or to uh, Michael Perry. And that is it. So there is time for questions. I'll check the chat. Um, I'm gonna stop recording at this point. Um, and then we can go ahead and we'll stay on for any questions that you may have. And I really appreciate, I know you guys are very limited in your time, so I appreciate you attending. And let us know if there's anything other support we can provide to you, either through these monthly meetings or in another, um, in another way.